And now it is my very distinct honor to introduce our next speaker to you. Um, it is somebody who I have really had the pleasure of working with the last few months. So I'd like to introduce Jasper Schneider, who, as I mentioned, is the acting RUS administrator. We are delighted to have him here with us at this meeting. Jasper actually has um, a really interesting background. He is somebody who has spent five years being the state director in North Dakota for rural development. So somebody who really understands rural America, the stresses you're under, and has been looking for creative ways to bring economic development into those communities. He's also served as a North Dakota legislator. He's an attorney. He's a businessman. He doesn't look old enough to have done all of that. But I have to tell you, Jasper has been in this acting position for a few months now. There is no better advocate that we could have in his position. So I'd love to have you give him a warm welcome, and I hope you all look forward to working with him. Good morning, everybody. Wow, it is good to be here. Uh, my name is Jasper Schneider, and, and that's not going to work. <laughs> we'll try this again. My name is Jasper Schneider, and I'm the acting administrator at the Rural Utility Service for the past six months. Now, here's one thing I've learned about being in Washington for the past six months, and, and keep in mind I'm a North Dakota guy, is there's a thing in Washington where the shorter your title, the more important that you are, right? And so when you have my title, which is, I think, the longest title in Washington, as the acting administrator of the United States Department of Agriculture's Rural Development, Rural Utility Service, uh, it's quite a mouthful. You quickly are reminded where you fall in the pecking order. But, but in all seriousness, it's, it's an absolute honor to be at the helm of a federal agency that ha makes such a tremendous impact in the lives of so many uh, across the country. And more importantly, uh, to work at an agency that has such deep roots with all of you. Uh, there is no finer organization in Washington than NTCA. You know that. And I consider it such an honor to, to be up here in front of you today. And I want to congratulate Terry, uh, your outgoing president, and welcome Jim as the incoming president. Let's give the, both of those guys a round of applause. Thank you for your leadership. And you have the best CEO in the business. Right? And Shirley Bloomfield. My job is easy because Shirley is so great and she has such wonderful members. Um, her fantastic staff, I had an opportunity to present to the board uh, a few months ago. Just a wonderful group of people. And I have such admiration for what you do in deploying high speed broadband internet across the country. And I hope you know that you have a friend and an ally and a partner in the rural utility service. I oftentimes get asked as I travel around in my home state or now in this RUS capacity across the country, what's happening in rural America? There's a lot of interest in rural. People that aren't from there or didn't grow up there or don't work in this, these industries, there's, there's a little bit of an intrigue, right? And they ask me, what's What's happening out there? Every single time, without hesitation, I say the biggest game changer is deployment of high-speed broadband internet. Because it accomplishes so many things at one time. It opens so many doors. Access to a high-speed connection taps into everybody's entrepreneurial spirit, allows them to start a business, transact business globally, no matter where they're sitting. Uh, it allows options for telework. It allows educational opportunities for you to go back and finish a degree or go back and obtain an advanced degree. Or for K through 12 districts to consolidate resources and share resources across the internet. Healthcare, changing the way we deliver telemedicine uh, for generations to come. And most importantly, probably access to news that allows family and friends to stay connected to their friends and loved ones. In essence, what you do is you bridge the divide that has existed from really the beginning of time between rural and urban. 
Nowadays, you can have the best of both worlds with the high quality of life of living in rural America, combined with that all-important outside lifeline. So thank you for what you do. A, a little bit about me. You're probably wondering why I'm on stage. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a North Dakota guy, uh, born and raised in Fargo. And at least there's one other North Dakotan here. <laughs> uh, born and raised, I went to a, a small liberal arts college in, in North Dakota, in a rural community, uh, about 10,000 people, big or small, depending on how you look at it. Uh, graduated, went to law school in Minnesota, and upon graduating from law school, uh, returned home to North Dakota, started a law practice, got involved with public service, and for the past five years, uh, I've had the pleasure of being the state director of USDA Rural Development, and for the past six months, the acting RUS administrator. But I, I want to share with you for just a few minutes uh, my own rural broadband story. Because I likely would not be up here if it wasn't for access to a rural broadband connection. So when I was in college, and I went to Jamestown College, which is a small college in Jamestown, North Dakota. Jamestown has about 10,000 people. Our college has about a little less than 1,000 students. And when I started, we, our campus was completely dial-up internet. And the, the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, we had an alum that made a donation to allow the college to partner with our rural telecom to deploy high-speed broadband internet across our campus. And so returning as a 19-year-old kid my sophomore year in our dorm room, uh, I, armed with this new high-speed broadband interconnect, internet connection, I started a business. You see, I grew up always interested in computers, tinkered with them, built my own, and started writing about them my sophomore year. I started a website covering the computer hardware industry. Now, initially when I started this website, I was writing reviews on products and posting news and writing industry columns, that kind of stuff. I started this website and I hosted it just on a server in my dorm room, thanks to this rural telecom. And after just a few weeks, the website continued to grow and to the point where I had to co-locate it elsewhere. And I remember after the first month, the website was growing so quickly that I got my bill from the host, for, and it was for $700, which is a lot of money. It was a lot of money then, and it's, it's a lot of money today. And so I was thinking to myself, what do I do? I thought, should I tell my parents? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't do that. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe I should just close this, this down, seven, write $700 off. Or I did what every good college kid did. I put it on the credit card. And the website the next month was even bigger than that. This website continued to grow. But also, thankfully, it also quickly monetized, where the, the checks started coming in and the revenue uh, started to be greater than the expenses, right? And so I ran this website for about 10 years. And it did very well at its height. We were getting about 30,000 unique IPs a day, 10 million page views a month. Our forum had 50,000 registered users, four to 500 people at any given time interacting on this website. Ran it throughout college. It allowed me to uh, go to work for Cisco for two years out of college. It allowed me to, uh, it kept growing. It allowed me to leave Cisco, pay my way through law school, subsidized my law practice in the, in the early years, and, and it did quite well. And so I, I share that with you because I would not be up here if it wasn't for the investments made by that particular rural telecom. The, the vision, the leadership that they had to seek financing, extend their networks. Little did I know at the time that that would lay the foundation, set the stage for me to go on and do these other things. And like any business, right, it starts as a hobby. That's really what I was doing. I didn't know how to run a business. I was 19 years old, sitting in my dorm room in North Dakota. Uh, but in hindsight, it was that rural connection that allowed me to do all of these other things. And I share that because there are similar stories like that happening all over the country because of the work that you do. Now, the, the facts of those stories may be different, but the themes are all the same. And thankfully, we've had policymakers in this country that have said that if you're going to have a United States of America, you've got to have a connected America, 
right? You can't have an urban America and a rural America. It has to be a connected United States of America. And they've backed that up with policies. You think about what was probably the original Rural Development Act, the Homestead Act, which was the federal government saying, let's push the map to the west, let's, en let's encourage people to go grow on the land, produce on the land, start families, build communities. Followed up by policy that said, let's connect this country from ocean to ocean by rail. In the 1930s, you had the Rural Electrification Act, something that started the Rural Electrification Administration, followed up by the Rural Telephone Act that said, let's make sure that every part of this great country has access to telephone service as essential infrastructure, as a public safety, interstate systems connecting this country by superhighways. And what you're doing today with really 21st century infrastructure in deploying high-speed broadband internet. It's remarkable. And so these policies that Shirley talked about, that you work on every day, it's so important to continuing that tradition of having a connected United States. One of the things we do at USDA, like so many other entities, is we release annual progress reports, right? And last summer when I was in North Dakota, we released our North Dakota report. And I was going around the state sharing this shiny new report hot off the press with our partners, our, the public, the press, to show them where these important public resources were going. And so I met with one of our editors of our, one of our state's largest newspapers. And I walked into their office and I, I handed the editor this report. And I sat down, he sat down, and he started thumbing through this report. And he's like, rural development, huh? And after a few minutes, he handed me this report back. And he said, you know, Jasper, uh, I made a decision a long time ago that people should just live in cities. He said, don't get me wrong. I love the countryside. I like to hunt and fish and that kind of thing. But I don't think people should live out in the country and expect the same level of amenities that you get in a more of a population center. And I thought that was incredibly interesting, because we know that that particular editor was wrong. We know that lots of people think like that. But thankfully, we've had those policymakers that have dictated policy that said otherwise, that we're going to connect this country. That editor didn't understand the, the important synergy that exists between rural and urban. The fact that the, the bedrock of this nation's values lies in rural America. The fact that most of the food, if not all of the food, that this country eats and this world eats happens in rural America. Most of the energy that we all consume is produced in rural America. And so what we do, what you do, is so important to that synergy that exists between rural and urban. And throughout all of that, uh, you have had a friend and a partner in the rural utility service. And I just want to share with you a few perspectives of my almost six months at, at RUS. What we've been able to do in the telecom industry is lots of things. In 2009, the Congress passed the Recovery Act, otherwise known as the Stimulus. Now, certainly the Stimulus has received its fair share of criticism, but I just want to talk about what it meant in the telecom world from an RUS perspective. What it did is that it opened up a one-time access to capital, a historic amount of money that advanced projects by years and, in many cases, decades. Uh, over $3 billion came through RUS to rural telecoms, over 250 projects, most of you probably in this room, and in the form of, in the form of loan and grants. I know in my home state of North Dakota, over $300 million came in, and our rural telecoms were, were ready for it. They took advantage of this financing. They built out their networks to places that they had never probably dreamed of that they'd be able to build out to. And as a result, in North Dakota, we have over 40,000 square miles of fiber to the home. It's been a remarkably successful program that has really advanced these networks across the country by, in many cases, decades. So that's the Recovery Act. We also have programs like the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant that says that let's use high-speed broadband internet and grant these dollars to educational institutions to buy equipment, to healthcare 
communities to buy equipment to use broadband internet to improve how they function. We also have a program called the Community Connect Grant, which some of you, I'm sure, have been recipients of this. This Community Connect Grant is not a ton of money from a national perspective, but it is grant dollars, and it allows you to apply and to fill in the map with underserved or no-service areas. But it's also important that we get back into the game of just doing traditional public financing for infrastructure. And I want to commend Shirley and your Government Affairs Committee and NTCA's advocacy in what you've been able to do with regards to the 2014 Farm Bill. In the 2014 Farm Bill, Congress reauthorized the Farm Bill Broadband Loan Program, which will allow us to get back into the business of doing traditional loans to you to help you meet your goals and, and meet your needs. And so we're in the final stages of writing the regulation for that and should be open for business again shortly with that program. Of course, when you, when you come into an organization of any size, uh, there's, there's going to be opportunities and challenges. Uh, at RUS, we went through a reorganization about a year ago. And one of, the, one of my goals coming into this job was making sure that we looked at how the reorganization went, and preserved what was working, but also used it as an opportunity to fine-tune what we are doing. A big component of that is making sure that we get fully staffed. Because if we're not fully staffed, uh, that, doesn't, that means that we can't be responsive to your needs. It means we can't be timely. It means we can't keep our general field reps close to you, our borrowers. So fine-tuning this reorganization and getting fully staffed has been a, a top priority for what we do. Shirley did a, a very nice job of talking about regulatory certainty. Now, RUS is not a regulatory agency. Uh, we're, we're the credit wing of the Department of Agriculture. But what we recognize is that your regulators have such a tremendous impact, not only on you, but on these large public investments in our portfolio. And so we spend considerable time at our US educating our regulatory partners about the impacts, good, bad, or otherwise, that their decisions have on rural America. On the electric side, that would be EPA. On the telecom side, we work with the FCC to make sure that they're very delicate about how they address USF, making sure that they understand how their actions impact this massive public investment, our portfolio, in loans that we have made to you. Uh, making sure that as they make their decisions, they understand what rural is. They understand what a cooperative is. They understand how that impacts our portfolio. So there's a big educational component to what we do with our regulators, and it's a form of, of us sticking up for you, preserving our portfolio, and helping what's, and doing what's right for rural America. I, I'm a firm believer that it takes a team to do this right. And we consider you our best partners. And I really just want to commend you uh, for what you do in deploying high-speed broadband internet across the country. When you make big decisions every day in your respective offices, when you sit around your boardrooms at your board meetings, you're dealing with some big numbers, right? And there, there's big risk, but also big opportunities. And I just want to commend you for your vision and your leadership in continuing to challenge yourselves to build out your networks to underserved areas, to unserved areas, but also building out your networks to support growth. Because even though oftentimes when we think rural, we think about the users at the end of the line, but we also know that your rural areas are growing. Populations are moving into areas that you've never seen before. And so maintaining your service territory while at the same time building out to new, years, new users, uh, that's incredibly important. It takes a lot of resources, and you have a good partner at RUS. And, and let me just close with that I think the, the cool thing about the investments that you make, the decisions that you make, is that these investments, they're not for us. They're for these generations that are yet to come. And what's, what's fun to think about is that these generations yet to come will use broadband internet in ways that none of us can begin to even imagine yet. 
That's what motivates me to continue doing what I do. Please keep up the great work. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Jasper, for sharing your insights. But I got to say this. Doesn't he look like the son that we would all love to have? <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, it's, it's nice to know, though, that rural America's future is in hands like uh, Jasper and will be in those great hands. And we do look forward to, to working with you in RUS uh, for years to come. So thanks, Jasper.